This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and this will be about solving degree two congruences. So um, this means that we want to solve the equation ax squared plus bx plus c is congruent to zero modulo p. Now we've already solved degree one congruences, ax plus b is congruent to zero by using Euclid's algorithm. So how do we solve degree two congruences? Well, we can start by just copying the usual way of solving quadratic equations over the reals by completing the square. So we write this as ax plus b over two or squared. And now this is going to be congruent to um, b squared minus four ac over four a. Um, well, there's a little bit of a problem here because we need to be able to divide by two. And if p is odd, this is okay because two is co-prime to p, so we can divide by it. What happens if p equals two? Well, then we can't do this because we can't divide by two. But, you know, if p is equal to two, if we just try x equals zero and x equals one as roots, so it's very easy to do this just by trying all possible cases. So we may as well assume that P is odd. Um, now, um, we notice this bit here is just the usual discriminant of the quadratic equation. And now it's enough to solve X squared is congruent to D for D the discriminant, because if we can find a square root of this discriminant, then if we move the a over here, we've got a 4a squared in the denominator, which is a square. So we can solve this, provided we can find a square root of the discriminant. So we're reduced to just solving this equation here. And now we should just check it has a solution before actually finding the solution. Well, we recall it has a solution. And the solution exists provided d to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to 1 modulo p. This was Euler's criterion that we discussed earlier and that we will also discuss a bit later. Um, I should say that we're taking d to be not congruent to 0 because otherwise this doesn't apply. If d is congruent to 0 and you can't figure out what its square root is, then you've really got problems. So suppose we now know that a square root of d exists. How do we find it? So we want the problem is now to solve x squared as congruent to d modulo p. And let's try method one. So method one is going to be trial and error. We just try x equals 0, 1, 2, and so on until it works. So for example, if we want to solve x squared as congruent to 2 modulo 7, let's try naught squared as congruent to 0. That's no good. 1 squared as congruent to 1. That's no good. 2 squared is congruent to 4, that's no good. 3 squared is congruent to 9, which is congruent to 2. And great, we've now found a square root of 2 just by checking all possible cases. And this method is obviously fine if our prime is very small and obviously utterly useless if our prime is large because it will just take too long. Um, so let's try another method. Method 2 is a polynomial solver. So there are several methods that will solve any polynomial fx is congruent to 0 modulo p. So the first one was found by Berlekamp. And there was another one found by Cantor and Sassenhaus. And in the next lecture, we will be discussing the one um, found by Cantor and Sassenhaus. And these will actually find roots of any polynomial mod p rather fast. And you may think, well, if we've got this something that will work for all polynomials, why are we wasting time doing the special case of square roots? Um, well, first of all, the method for finding square roots is a lot faster. Um, it's quite a lot easier, and it also works in greater generality. For, for example, it will also um, find square roots of numbers in arbitrary groups, whereas the, the, the Berlekamp and the cantor zassenhaus method only work in rather special cases of finite fields or integers modulo p. Um, so um, let's now try method three. Method three is to guess the answer. 
Um, well, guessing the answer sounds kind of unprofessional. So what you should say is you're trying out an ansatz. Now, ansatz is a German word that basically just means guess. But since it's a German word, it sounds um, very serious and so on. So um, um, an ansatz means you write down um, a sort of formula for the answer with some free parameters in it. And you then try and adjust the free parameters to find your solution. So, so if we're trying to solve x squared is congruent to d, what we do is we try x is equal to some function of um, d. For instance, we could try something to the power of d, or we could try d to the power of something, or we could try um, a0 plus a1d plus a2d squared or something. There are various things you can try. Um, and which of these should we do? Well, you notice this says x is equal to d to the half. So we, we want an ansatz that sort of looks a little bit like this. And this is d to the power of something. Um, so this suggests that maybe this one is the way to go. We, we, let, let, let's try x is equal to d to the k for some k and try and figure out what k is. So k is going to be an integer. And at first sight, this kind of looks stupid because here we want to take x to the power of something that... So we want to take x to be d to the power of something that very definitely isn't an integer. And it doesn't look as if we're going to be able to do that by taking d to the power of an integer. But let, let, let's try it and see what happens. So let's take this and substitute it into this equation here. And this gives us d to the 2k is congruent to d. Or let's say d to the 2k minus 1 is congruent to 1. So we want to find a k um, satisfying this equation here. Well, um, you remember we had this condition that d to the p minus 1 over 2 was congruent to 1 because d has a square root. And now let's just compare this with this. And we see that we can solve it if p minus 1 over 2 is odd. Because then we can just take k is equal to p minus 1 over 2, and then we add 1 and divide it by 2. And this will now give us the solution um, x is equal to d to the k. Well, um, what's this condition equivalent to? Well, this just says that p is congruent to 3 modulo 4. The p is 1 modulo 4, this fails. So we've managed to solve, find square roots very quickly for half of all possible primes. Well, that does the case p is 3 mod 4. What if p is 1 mod 4? Um, what can we do? Well, let's, let's just play around a bit and see what we can come up with. So we've got... Um, um, we know that um, um, d to the p minus 1 over 2 is congruent to 1. And now um, p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. Well, what does that say? It says that this is even. Well, what can you do? Well, if it's even, let's try dividing it by 2. So we get d to the p minus 1 over 4. And this is going to be congruent to the square root of 1. So it'll either be plus 1 or minus 1, and we don't quite know which. And we want to find the square root of d. Let's try multiplying both sides by d. So we get d to the p plus 3 over 4 is now congruent to plus, one, plus or minus 1, modulo p. And now let's think about this a bit. Sorry, that'll be plus or minus d. And now suppose that we get the plus d here. And also suppose that p plus 3 over 4 is even. Well, in that case, we can find a square root of d just by taking the square root of this side. So, so we get d to the p plus 3 over 8 squared is now congruent to plus d. So there are some cases when we can do it. Um, and let, let, let's kind of just investigate these a bit further. So first of all, this case here corresponds to p being congruent to 5 mod 8. So if p is 1 mod 4, it's either 1 or 5 mod 8, and this at least does the ones that are 5 mod 8. And what about this condition? Well, what happens if it's minus d? 
Well, that's actually quite easy because minus 1 has a square root. Um, you remember we could find a square root of minus 1 when p is 1 mod 4 just by taking a random number a and taking it to the p minus 1 over 4, and there was about a 50% chance that this gives us a square root of minus 1. So if minus d has a square root, then the square root of d is just the square root of minus d times the square root of minus 1. So once we found a square root of minus d, we can easily convert this into a square root of d. So we can solve this equation quite quickly whenever p is congruent to 5 modulo 8. And we can sort of go on like this. Um, we can, um, if, 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 if d is 1 modulo 8, then it's either 1 or 9 modulo 16. And it turns out that if we do it 9 modulo 16, then we can solve it and so on. So, so let's look at the worst case. Suppose p is of the form 1 plus 2 to the k. So the, the, these are the ones that seem to be giving the most trouble. So here we have a Fermat prime. Um, and let's try and find square roots. x squared is congruent to d modulo uh, this Fermat prime. So here, um, the number of non-zero residues is now a power of 2. And what we're going to do first is pick a primitive root g. Um, so g to the 2k is congruent to what g to the 2 to the k is congruent to 1 and um, that's true for no smaller exponent and we can find a primitive root easily just by sort of randomly guessing um, and now uh, suppose that um, suppose d has order 2 to the i for some for some i um uh some integer i um it must have a order of power of two because it divides two to the k well we notice that g to the two to the k minus i also has order two to the i in fact we notice that d is equal to g to the two to the k minus i times something odd because these are, these are the things that have ordered 2 to the i. Um, so, g to the 2 to the k minus i times d um, is g to the 2 to the k minus i times something even. Um, so, it is order um, less than 2 to the i. Um, because this bit here is even. So we can now take the square root of d. Well, um, it's first of all, we can take the square root of this. So, so we take g to the um, 2 to the k minus i minus 1. Well, I guess we should take g to the minus that. And then we multiply it by the square root of this. Well, how do we work out the square root of this bit? Well, well this is a smaller order than g than d. So we can find the square root of d by doing a series of steps. Each step reduces the order of d by a factor of at least 2. So after a rather small finite number of steps, we, we, we end up with the square root of d. Um, now let's discuss the general case. So we've done the case of odd order and we've done the case of order of power of two and the idea is we can split up any case into the case of odd order and the case of order of power of two um so um suppose um 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 so, so, so suppose p minus one is equal to two to the k times n with with n odd um then um, we, we, we pick G um, to, to have order 2 to the K. And how do we pick G like this? Well, well G is equal to some random number to the power of N. And um, sooner or later, we will find a random number to the nth power whose order is exactly 2 to the K. 
And what we do now is we solve 2 to the k times s plus nt um, equals 1 by Euclid. But why do we do this? Well, we're going to... Um, we're going to use this to, to write every element as the product of an element of order of power of 2 times an element of odd order. Um, so what we do is we pick an element y, and we write y, which is y to the 1, is going to be y to the n to the t times y to the 2k to the power of s. And now this thing has order a power of 2, because it must have order must dividing two to the k, and this thing has odd order. Um, so now we can find a square root, a square root of this using method three, and we can find a square root of things that have an order of um, power of two using the previous method. So we can find the square root of this bit and the square root of this bit, and we can obviously get the square root of y by taking the square root of this bit to the power of t times the square root of this bit to the power of s. So this is a sort of divide and conquer method. We, 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 we split up finding the square roots into the problem of finding square roots of things of odd order and the problem of finding things of square roots of order of power of 2, and then we sort of combine them. So in order to illustrate this, I'll do an example. So let's find, let's solve x squared is congruent to 2 modulo 41. And of course, we should pretend that 41 is so big that we can't do this by trial and error. Um, so um, we first of all look at the order of the group of residue classes prime, prime to 41, which is order 40. So we write 40 um, is equal to... 2 to the 5, uh, sorry, 2 cubed times 5. So this the power of 2, and this is odd, and this, of course, is just p minus 1. Um, let's find an element of order 2 to the 3, and what we do is we take a random number, and um, uh, to the power of 5 and see if it works. And if we try 3, three works, 3 to the 5 works. So 3 to the 5 is common to 38 um, mod 41. And you can check this does, in fact, of order 2 cubed. So that's a sort of analog of a primitive root in the case of Fermat primes we did. Next, we solve. Um, 2 cubed times s plus 5 times t is equal to 1 using Euclid. And I'm not going to write this out. We can just take s equals minus 3, t equals 5. So we write 2 is equal to 2 to the 8 to the minus 3 times 2 to the 5 to the power of 5. And now what we want to do is we want to take a square root of this bit and a square root of this bit. Well, the first bit is easy. Um, um, square root of 2 to the 8 is just 2 to the 4. Um, so that's that bit done. Um, now we've got the problem of finding a square root of, of, of um, um, uh, uh, 2 to the 5. And so we've got to solve x squared is congruent to 32, and this has order 8. So um, um, uh, we find the order of 32, and we can do this by repeatedly squaring it until we get 1. So 32 squared is congruent to 40, 40 squared is congruent to 1. So 32 has order 4, which is just 2 squared. And now we write put now we put um, 32 is equal to 38 squared times something. And that becomes 38 squared times 40. So th th this now has order 
um, less than 2 squared. And 38 squared has an obvious square root. The square root of 38 squared is just 38. And now we write 40, that's this number here, as 38 to the 4 times something. Um, in fact, we find it's 38 to the 4 times 1. And now that, that's rather nice because it's easy to find the square root of 1. And now 38 to the 4 has an obvious square root. The square root is just equal to 38 squared. So now we've managed to write 32 as a product of various things that whose square roots we know. So we write 32 is equal to 38 squared times 38 to the 4. So the square root of 32 is just um, 38 times 38 squared which is congruent to 14. So finally, we find the square root of 2 is equal to 2 to the 4 to the minus 3 times 14 to the power of 5. And we can now work this out as it's being congruent to 24 um, modulo 41. Um, by the way, um, a similar um, version of this will not just not only find square roots, you can also use it to find things like cube roots and fourth roots and fifth roots by by doing something slightly more complicated but i won't give details of that okay next lecture we'll discuss the cantor zazenhaus method for finding roots of arbitrary polynomials